Hi, I'm Dave Hillowitz. So this past Sunday, I went out for a walk in my neighborhood and there was a guy selling junk on the street, which is super common for this area. And I usually don't even check because the stuff this guy has is usually like old power adapters and broken electronics and stuff. But on Sunday, he had something really, really exciting, which was two violins, both of which I purchased, obviously. So yeah, I've been doing some digging, some research, uh, and I thought it'd be really fun to make a video about uh, both of them, uh, probably more focused on this one, which is really cool. Uh, before we talk about the good one, let's talk about this one, which is kind of a piece of junk. Um, this one uh, says Jacobus Stainer on the inside label. Jacobus Stainer was like this famous violin maker from I think like the 16th century. This is not a Jacobus Stainer. It's a, a mass produced piece of junk. You can tell, I mean, it's been like bolted together, which, you know, no violin should be bolted together. Um, it sounds pretty dreadful. Um, and it's been set up as a fiddle. Um, there's no difference between a violin and a country Western fiddle. Uh, but fiddle players tend to like a really low, like flat bridge. Uh, the reason for that is it causes you to hit multiple strings at the same time. For uh, a classical violinist, that's like the bane of their existence. But for a country western player where double stops are kind of like a huge part of the sound, uh, you actually want to be able to hit both strings at the same time. So that's the reason for that. It's had its tuning pegs replaced with these kind of like aftermarket guitar tuners with gears and stuff. That's pretty cool. I'm a little bit envious. You won't see that on any like instruments that are intended for like classical musicians. Apparently, like in the 20s, a, a whole ton of uh, instruments were made in Germany that said Jacobus Stainer. So probably this was made in like 1925 somewhere in Germany. I have no real complaints with the instrument other than the fact that it sounds like absolutely terrible. So anyway, enough about the instrument itself. A funny thing happened. Uh, when I got this home, I could hear that something was like rattling inside of it. And, uh, you know, I was like, oh no, the sound post fell down or, you know, some piece of debris or something got caught in it. So anyway, I knew that there was like something inside that I had to get out. So I was kind of like moving it around and I could see there was something that looked like an insect nest or maybe, you know, I, I couldn't figure it out. It was like something biological and like very disgusting. And obviously I was like totally horrified. So I got, um, you know, a, a really long tweezers and I held the thing like this over my toilet and I just kind of like tweezed the thing out and it was huge. It was just this multi-segmented thing and it was just like so awful and disgusting. So yeah, I flushed it down the toilet and I did my best to like get rid of that mental image. About four hours later, I was on the internet and I was like doing research about these fiddles, trying to figure out like, is this thing worth anything? Like, what is it supposed to actually sound like? And there was a guy who was selling almost the exact same fiddle on eBay. And he was like, yeah, it's even got a rattlesnake tail in the body. And I was like, what? So I Googled fiddle rattlesnake tail. And sure enough, that's like a thing. People put rattlesnake tails in fiddles, I guess, like it's an old superstition. Uh, and nobody even really knows why. Uh, some guy who was saying that like his dad gave him a fiddle when he was a kid and put the rattlesnake tail in. And he was like, dad, why are you doing this to my fiddle? And his dad was like, if you can hear the rattlesnake rattling around as you play, you know that you're playing too hard. So yeah, I may have flushed the only thing that made this violin even remotely charming. Okay, so let's talk about this violin. This instrument actually has the name of an actual human being who really actually made this instrument, uh, a guy named Lewis Pyle uh, in Pennsylvania. So it's local. Uh, and the reason that's so surprising is that like a lot of the cheap violins that are floating around from like the 1890s through maybe 1950 don't have the name of an actual violin maker in them. They have like either it will say like Stradivarius or something like that, like something that's just like designed to fool uh, people who don't know anything about the violin market or uh, it'll just like have the name of like a company. So you don't find that many that were actually made by a violin maker. So I googled Lewis Pyle, didn't come up with anything. In case you don't know, violins have this thing inside called a sound post. It's basically like a little wooden dowel that sits uh, inside the body and it extends from just about here to the back of the instrument. And it's the thing that actually prevents the violin from caving in. Otherwise, uh, the pressure of all of these strings pushing down on the body would actually cause the whole violin to cave in. Um, so yeah, this violin had a sound post that had fallen down. So I could see inside that like, there was basically this bar of wood that was rattling around. So I called the violin maker that I usually go to and made an appointment so that he could like um, put the sound post back in place. He's got this beautiful shop that's just like filled with old instruments. And before I even got there, there was a guy like consigning an $80,000 cello. So you, you get a kind of idea of the kind of place I took this to. 
I think seeing the $80,000 cello and then seeing my like $20 street violin just like sent him over the edge because he was just like completely brutal. He was like, oh, I hope you didn't pay a lot of money for that. And I was like, no, it's like 20 bucks. And he was like, okay, well, um... and then, you know, he saw that the maker was like Lewis Pyle and uh, he looked Lewis Pyle up in this big book and lo and behold, there was no Lewis Pyle. And he was like, well, if you were anyone who was anyone, he would be in this book. And I was like, okay, he was no one. Um, and then he looked at the sound post and he was like, whoever did this was a rank amateur. He was just really angry. And, uh, you know, he showed me the sound post, basically the wood grain was exactly perpendicular to the way it should have been. And he showed me a good sound post that he had made. And, you know, they were all very uniform and they, they looked very different. So he's, you know, he's fooling with the sound post, trying to get this like terrible sound post into place. And at that moment, I decided to tell him the story about the other violin and, and the rattlesnake tail. And I was like, have you ever heard of that? You know, putting a rattlesnake tail in a fiddle. And he like wouldn't even make eye contact with me. He was like, I've been doing this for 50 years. I'm a sixth generation violin maker. And that was all he said. And I was like, ooh, I brought this instrument to the wrong guy. <laughs> Imagine if he saw my box cello. But anyway, he was actually kind of a doll. And he actually gave me a free sound post that he had made. Uh, so yeah, no complaints. But yeah, I left his shop just feeling kind of crestfallen. I felt bad for myself and I kind of felt bad for Lewis Pyle because like, look at this beautiful violin. So yeah, that's my goal with this video. I want to find out who Lewis Pyle was and uh, yeah, hopefully make some nice music along the way. So who was Lewis Pyle? According to official paperwork, Lewis Edwin Pyle was born on December 15th, 1869. He's mentioned in 1871 in Quaker church documentation. He's listed by his father on the 1880s census. The next thing I turned up was pretty bleak. In 1886, at the age of 16, Lewis did something really bad. I'm not exactly sure what. He was arrested and pled guilty to larceny. As part of his sentence, he was supposed to receive 10 lashes, but the lashings were commuted by the governor of Delaware. As you can see, the portrait that the article paints of justice in the 1880s is pretty awful. By the age of 26, Lewis's life was firmly back on track. In fact, in 1895, he applied for a patent for a new kind of mandolin he'd invented. He would later call it the Eveline. Here's what the instrument actually looked like. During this time, Lewis produced a number of mandolins, as well as violins, which he would sell for about $25 a piece at music stores in Wilmington, Delaware. In fact, the violin that I bought came with a case that said Salter's Music Shop, Wilmington, Delaware. Despite his foray into the world of musical instruments, I think other things were probably more profitable. On the 1900 census, he was listed as music teacher. By the 1910 census, he listed his occupation as laborer, odd jobs. By 1920, he was a rush seater. In fact, it seems that for the rest of his life, he would make rush seats. In 1948, the Philadelphia Inquirer did a two-page fluff piece about the man himself. It's a great little article that shows every step that went into the making of these chairs. It even offers DIY tips should you want to try your hand at making your own. This picture here, that's Lewis the guy who made my violin. At this point, he was 77 years old. He and his son Francis had built up quite a business out of these seats. The last article I was able to find about Lewis, before his obituary that is, was this nice photo of him as an old man with a violin tucked under his chin. The caption reads, Lewis E. Pyle, 83, demonstrates his proficiency at the fiddle at the 24th annual Old Fiddler's Picnic held yesterday. Lewis Pyle died on February 28, 1964, at the age of 94. And yes, his obituary did mention the violins. So yeah, he lived to a ripe old age. Uh, I've made samples of his violin and um, yeah, I'm releasing them for free now. It's a, it's a very basic sample, it's not a product. Uh, because it's so simple, I've actually made it in three versions, uh, SFZ, Contact, and Ableton. Uh, it's basically just like one note per sample, but I think it sounds really nice. So yeah, I hope you uh, you download those and enjoy them. Uh, if you've been enjoying these videos, it'd be great if you'd hit the little subscribe button so you could be notified when I make more. Um, yeah, time to go make some music. <laughs>